All right, I, I think we should get started because I want to make sure that um, that Dr. McMacken has enough time to share all of her knowledge with us. So um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to another virtual cardiology grand rounds. Um, I have the distinct pleasure and honor of uh, introducing our guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Michelle McMacken. Uh, she is an associate professor of medicine at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. She is an honors graduate of Yale University and Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, and she practices internal medicine in the adult primary care center uh, at NYC Bellevue, part of the largest safety net healthcare system in the United States. She also directs Bellevue's adult weight management program and plant-based lifestyle medicine program. Through a, a 2014 NYU Marin Fellowship grant, Dr. McMacken studied evidence-based nutrition and developed a nutrition curriculum for her internal medicine faculty colleagues. She has re received the Faculty Teacher of the Year Award three times for her work with physician trainees and has presented on nutrition at the American College of Physicians, the American Diabetes Association, and other national academic conferences. Dr. McMacken serves on the board of directors for the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and is committed to teaching and practicing evidence-based lifestyle as medicine. And that's exactly what she's going to talk to us about today. Um, and you know, I, I would start by, by framing this as, as really not, not just a medical issue, but also as, as an ethical one as well, not to put too much of, of my own uh, personal uh, angle on it, but uh, I've, I've heard through the years a lot of really nihilistic comments from, from trainees and from colleagues about, oh, well, patients won't change the way they eat, or that's not really our job as physicians. We should be spending time on medications, and, and you know, other allied health professionals can counsel about that. But um, I think as, as Dr. McMacken will show us, um, the, the data is extraordinarily compelling about the impact of, of optimal nutrition on cardiovascular health. And I, I really think that you know, particularly those of us who, who are physicians um, based on our educational privilege, our financial privilege, and our, our, our privilege of influence within the community, we really do have an obligation to, to do a better job, both in terms of patient care and of advocacy in really implementing some of these strategies, because this is just as important as goal-directed medical therapy and, you know, statins for primary prevention and secondary prevention. We, we know this works as well, and we're just not giving it the time and attention it deserves. So um, of course, good ethics starts with good data. And um, with on that note, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Dr. McMacken so she can present the, the data and also present strategies um, to help us do better in this regard. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hull. It's a huge honor to be speaking to the group today. And uh, I just wanna thank everyone for, for coming and for showing, uh, showing interest in this topic uh, that I'm very passionate about. So I'll go ahead and share my screen here. So today, uh, as you know, I'll be speaking on plant-based nutrition for cardiometabolic risk reduction. I wanna start with some disclosures. Uh, I have no financial disclosures, but as you heard from Dr. Hull, I do direct a plant-based lifestyle medicine program at, at Bellevue Hospital. And uh, naturally I practice what I preach, so I eat a plant-based diet. So yes, uh, in fact, you have invited an herbivore to speak today. So what I'm hoping you'll get out of today's talk um, is that you'll come to understand the key elements of uh, what makes up a healthy plant-based eating pattern. I'll certainly review uh, uh, the evidence that supports using plant-based diets for cardiometabolic risk reduction and some of the mechanisms by which these diets work. And then I'll wrap up with a discussion of some practical strategies. How can you actually implement this um, in your day-to-day -day practice? I wanna start by acknowledging that I didn't always know a lot about nutrition. Um, I'm sure like many of you, um, this was the type of nutrition that you learned in medical school. So uh, ramifications of micronutrient deficiencies, such as thiamine deficiency leading to beriberi. Um, and although this is interesting and important, uh, I have to acknowledge that uh, this has not really played a huge role. It's not been very relevant for my day-to-day -day practice where um, I treat type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, heart disease, fatty liver, and numerous other conditions uh, related to dietary choices. It's even more ironic when you look at the 10 leading causes of death in the United States, and uh, we know that at least seven 
are directly related to nutrition, including our number one and number two causes of death, heart disease and cancer. In fact, a poor quality diet is actually the number one risk factor for dying of a chronic disease today. Um, it actually uh, surpasses tobacco use at the population level. And if I haven't convinced you yet, uh, it's, it's estimated that fully 45% of deaths from heart disease, stroke, and diabetes are directly attributable to a suboptimal diet. So what this means is that we're excluding uh, smoking, uh, being sedentary, a family history. We're just talking about the burden that is directly related to, um, to nutrition. So nutrition certainly matters. So on that note, I wanna take a moment to see uh, what you guys think. What, what are Americans actually eating? Um, feel free to, to jump into the chat box and tell me, does anyone, what do you guys think is the number one source of calories? What type of food is the number one source of calories among uh, Americans? Ah, good guesses already. French fries, sports drinks, Hamburg, oh wow. Okay, this is, uh, these are excellent, excellent guesses. However, nobody has gotten the right answer yet. So I'll go ahead and reveal the number one source of calories in the average uh, American's diet is actually dessert, um, a grain-based dessert. So a lot of refined grains with added sugar and um, usually unhealthy fats. Number two, um, I think a couple of people said breads. So these are refined bread products um, are the number two source of calories. We're not talking about whole grain breads here. Um, number three, I think one person hinted at, and that's amazing because um, nobody ever gets number three, um, and it's chicken. So uh, we consume chicken as the number three source of calories in our, in our diets. And I will, as you'll see throughout the talk, um, I do think that there's an opportunity cost to focusing um, primarily on animal protein for, uh, for your protein in your diet, and it definitely pays to diversify into plant sources of protein. Number four are all of our sweetened drinks. And number five, uh, number five source of calories in the average American's diet, a category unto itself, is pizza. Um, when I give this talk to our residents, a lot of them then say, oh, wow, this looks like our noon conference food. <laughs> and, um, unfortunately, I think things are starting to change, but unfortunately, this is just a standard diet. This is what most people are actually used to. So how does this compare to what our consensus nutrition recommendations are in the United States for chronic disease prevention and overall health? Well, um, it's pretty different because we're asked to emphasize vegetables, fruits, whole grains, nuts and seeds, um, healthy sources of protein that are lean, such as, you know, for example, legumes like beans or lentils. Um, and we're asked to limit or avoid foods that are high in saturated fats or sodium. So that includes processed meats like bacon, um, sausage, hot dogs, deli meats, um, cold cuts. Um, it also includes uh, uh, fattier red meats such as beef and pork, lamb, um, high fat dairy and cheeses, butter, uh, added sugars, refined grains, which are really whole grains that have been ultra processed um, and ultra processed foods in general. So with that as background, um, I'd like to talk about what is a plant-based diet and how does it compare to these nutrition recommendations? So I think that um, sometimes when I mention the term plant-based diet, there is a perception that maybe I'm asking people are to consume salads all day or you know, committing them to a lifetime of rabbit food. Um, but in reality, especially in 2021, a plant-based diet is really um, a very abundant, diverse, uh, satisfying and um, frankly, very delicious um, way to eat. So there are different types of plant-based diets. Um, a vegetarian diet is of course a diet that excludes um, all forms of meat, but it can include eggs and dairy. Um, it can also include refined grains and added sugars and other highly processed foods. A vegan diet excludes all animal products, um, but it can certainly include the refined grains and added sugars and processed foods. And what I like to call a healthful plant-based diet is really an eating pattern that tends to limit all of these foods. So it doesn't have to be 100% um, you know, exclusive, but it does tend to really limit animal foods and the ultra-processed um, uh, non-animal foods. So what are you actually eating when you're consuming a healthful plant-based diet? Well, again, you're focusing on um, fruits and vegetables, mostly in their whole form, um, plant sources of protein and fat, such as um, legumes, nuts, and seeds. 
and whole grains, um, which I've given some examples here, but um, brown rice, oats, barley, farro, there's literally uh, you know, dozens of different types of whole grains. So um, this type of eating pattern, this healthful plant-based diet is really um, completely aligned with current um, recommendations for cardiovascular risk reduction. It's also aligned with uh, recommendations for diabetes prevention and treatment, as well as cancer prevention and cancer survivorship um, and general health guidelines. And in addition, I don't have time to talk um, in detail about this, but it's a plant-based diet is, is actually aligned with recommendations for planetary health and environmental sustainability. Um, so again, we're asked for, the, for planetary health to focus on plant sources of protein and plant sources of fat and really to limit animal protein, uh, dairy, um, as well as added sugars. So what about a Mediterranean diet? Uh, there's definitely a, a very, very uh, a wealth of evidence supporting the use of Mediterranean diets for both primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Uh, but I think the thing with a Mediterranean diet is that people tend to romanticize what a Mediterranean diet really is. So unfortunately, our dinner does not become a Mediterranean dinner just because we are having a glass of wine with it. Um, in reality, uh, there are Mediterranean diet scoring systems um, for which you get points for consuming more grains, beans, fruits, vegetables, um, olive oil as your primary source of fat, um, fi some fish, as well as moderate alcohol. And you lose points. Your diet is less Mediterranean if you are consuming more dairy, more poultry, and more red meat. So as you can see, really a well-constructed Mediterranean diet falls under the general umbrella of a plant-based diet. They're not mutually exclusive. And in fact, um, when research of, researchers have tried to go back and understand what are the foods within a Mediterranean diet that actually tend to confer the most benefit? Um, what is the anatomy of the health effects? What they see uh, consistently is the more plant foods in your diet, the better outcomes and the higher intake of meats in your Mediterranean diet, the worse outcomes. So let's turn to uh, what I call a taste of the evidence um, supporting plant-based nutrition for uh, cardiometabolic risk reduction. So vegetarian diets have been linked to huge reductions in uh, ischemic heart disease, both incidence and mortality. When you look at these cohorts, these are very large cohorts from around the world, um, all of which in these observational studies have been adjusted for uh, multiple potential confounders. So this is, this is very compelling evidence that we see and, and consistently across, you know, across different studies that we see this, um, this dramatic risk reduction in the risk of ischemic heart disease. But I think it's also important to look at omnivores um, or non-vegetarians who tend to consume a lot of plant foods. And there's a number of studies looking at this um, over the past few years. This is one that was published in 2019 in uh, using the atherosclerosis risk in communities cohort. Uh, and what the, what the researchers did is they actually, you know, most of, the, most of the participants are omnivores, but they ranked them according to how plant-based their diet was. And sure enough, what they saw is that those in the highest quintile of eating plant-based, so those really emphasizing the majority of their calories from plant-based foods, um, though not exclusively, um, experienced significant benefit in terms of cardiovascular disease, mortality, um, and all-cause mortality. And of course, this was adjusted for um, numerous, um, numerous risk factors. So this really, again, shows that um, there's a huge benefit just to moving along the spectrum towards a more plant-based diet, even if you're not able to be or willing to be 100% plant-based. And this begs the question now, are all plant-based diets equally beneficial? This was a really important, uh, really a landmark study published in 2017 um, using, using these, this very large, uh, these very large data sets. And what they did was they looked at the risk of coronary heart disease in a general population. Again, um, most participants were omnivores. And again, they ranked them according to how plant-based their, their diets were. Uh, but these researchers were really smart because they realized you know, I could be consuming French fries and Oreos all day. And I could call that a plant-based diet because it doesn't have animal foods in it. Um, so these researchers went ahead and stratified the plant-based eaters into two groups those that were consuming healthful, a healthful version of a plant-based diet, which is largely based in whole foods. Um, and I always say, thank, 
thank goodness coffee's on this list. Um, and those who are consuming sort of an unhealthful version of a plant-based diet where it was really um, emphasizing uh, processed foods like fruit juices, white flour, desserts, French fries, potato chips, um, sweetened drinks. Not surprisingly, they found again that same, you know, 25% risk reduction um, for those consuming a healthful plant-based diet. Uh, but this is really one of the first studies to show that just excluding animal foods is not enough to get you the benefit. In fact, consuming an unhealthful version of a plant-based diet is actually associated with significant increased risk of coronary heart disease. And you can see here, um, you can see here that the um, unhealthful plant-based diet, which is the dotted line, is really about the same as the animal food-rich diet. Um, so, so if you're going to recommend or consume a plant-based diet, you really want to be um, most of the time focusing on the less processed plant foods. Now, most of the data I've just shown is for primary prevention, um, but what about those already living with cardiovascular disease? Uh, so uh, many of you may be familiar with the Lifestyle Heart Trial. This is a, a famous uh, uh, randomized controlled trial uh, published in the 90s uh, where uh, researchers took patients who already had established coronary artery disease and randomized them to either follow a plant-based lifestyle program, so not just a diet, but also other elements of a healthy lifestyle, versus their physician's dietary advice. And they looked at three things. One was the uh, degree of coronary artery stenosis at baseline one year and five years. And what you can see is there's a big difference between the control group and the treatment group in terms of um, progression of stenosis. Um, but possibly, but really more importantly, there's a big difference in terms of symptoms and cardiovascular events. So I think it's safe to say that it's never too late for your patients to adopt a healthier lifestyle um, and they really can probably still have benefit. So how do plant-based diets actually work uh, to reduce cardiovascular risk? Well, I think the most obvious point is just simply that you're replacing less healthful foods or crowding them out with the healthier foods. So you're emphasizing again, all of these foods which, for which there's a vast amount of evidence supporting uh, reduction in cardiovascular risk, particularly for whole grains, I may add. Um, and you're crowding out foods that are linked to cardiovascular disease, especially foods like processed meats and added sugars, um, which are very closely tied to uh, cardiovascular risk. And so um, many studies are now sort of looking at this substitution or replacement effect and quantifying it. And um, I love th this study published in 2016, uh, where they looked at you know, animal versus plant protein um, and all cause and cause specific mortality. And what they found is um, higher plant protein was associated with lower cardiovascular and all cause mortality. Um, so emphasizing plant protein um, was, was very beneficial. And specifically among those that had one or more lifestyle risk factors, replacing just 3% of daily calories with a plant source of protein instead of animal protein was linked to mortality reductions across the board for every type of animal protein they studied. And these were all significant. Um, this was especially uh, notable for replacing processed red meats as well as replacing eggs. And just to put it in context, what, what, does, re, what does replacing 3% of your calories look like? Well, it looks like swapping out an egg and eating a quarter cup of black beans. That is uh, really very doable for many, many people. So again, every little bit counts. So independent of the replacement effect, there are characteristics of a plant-based diet that confer benefit. So uh, lower energy density, you're just you tend to consume fewer calories when you emphasize plant foods, um, largely because of the dietary fiber. Um, and then dietary fiber itself has, has benefits in terms of cardiometabolic risk. Um, tends to emphasize healthier fats like uh, polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats over the saturated fats. Um, very high levels of antioxidants, uh, beneficial micronutrients such as potassium and magnesium, and then of course low levels of what we know to be um, harmful dietary factors such as iron that's found in its heme or animal-based form, as well as the nitrate and uh, nitrate preservatives uh, typically used for processed meats. All of this translates into intermediate uh, benefits uh, such as in <clears throat> the lipid profile, blood pressure, body weight, inflammation, vascular health, 
uh, the gut microbial profile and its metabolites and glycemic control. And then that of, that of course in turn leads to reduced cardiovascular risk. So what I'm gonna go through now are just some of this inter, some of the data around the intermediate endpoints, uh, starting with lipids. So uh, randomized controlled trials show that depending on what type of plant-based diet you select, you can get up to about a 35% reduction in your LDL cholesterol, which is obviously um, right on par with <clears throat> right on par with some of the statins that we use. Um, and obviously, if you're pairing this with um, guideline-directed medical therapy and using statins where indicated, this effect can be uh, very robust. And part of why, you know, these are the reasons why plant-based diets tend to lower uh, uh, LDL cholesterol and even triglycerides um, if they're done right, is because you tend to emphasize polyunsaturated fats over the saturated fats, and they tend to be high in fiber. Um, and there's probably some benefit from leaving out um, the dietary cholesterol, um, the phytosterols um, in, in, these, in these plant foods, as well as soy proteins, which can have an effect as well. When it comes to blood pressure, we know from both observational data and interventional data that uh, plant-based diets are potent. So um, in observational studies, vegetarian diets have been associated consistently with lower blood pressure um, compared to other diets. And in interventional studies, vegetarian diets um, have been shown to reduce blood pressure more than their comparator diets with a significant difference between groups. Um, this brings me to the DASH diet, which I think most of us would probably consider um, uh, the gold standard um, for uh, treatment of hypertension in terms of the data that we have out there. Um, and yet what's interesting is that the DASH diet was actually originally inspired by a vegetarian diet. So one of the, um, the authors of the original authors of the DASH diet actually famously said uh, the DASH diet was originally created to quote, have the blood pressure lowering benefits of a vegetarian diet and yet contain enough animal products to make it palatable to non-vegetarians. So indeed, the DASH diet emphasizes a range of plant foods, especially whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. Um, it does include low-fat dairy, but it very much limits red meats, uh, processed meats, and of course, um, sweets. Interestingly, um, in 2015, a study was published looking at what's called a portfolio diet. Um, and this, is a, uh, this has been studied quite a bit for cholesterol lowering, but it's a fully plant-based diet that contains some added fiber um, as well as soy and nuts. And this was shown to lower blood pressure compared to a DASH style diet. So in terms of weight management, this is where um, another, another area in which plant-based diets really shine. So we have uh, different types of evidence. We have cross-sectional studies, um, hypothesis generating, um, that do show that consistently plant-based eaters do tend to have healthier uh, body mass indices. In prospective studies, we see that diets that are low in fiber and high in meat, which is really the, the opposite of a plant-based diet, are strongly tied to weight gain. And in clinical trials, we see that plant-based diets can be very effective for weight loss. Uh, this is a meta-analysis uh, published in 2016 that showed that um, among randomized controlled trials, weight loss was significantly greater with vegetarian diets compared to non-vegetarian diets, and especially if you um, adopted a vegan diet where, where the effect was actually uh, even greater. One of the most important studies, um, clinical trials, uh, looking at weight loss with a plant-based diet um, is the BROAD study, which took, uh, this is a randomized trial of 65 uh, overweight adults with uh, cardiometabolic risk factors. Um, they were uh, assigned to follow a, what's called a whole food plant-based diet intervention. So just focusing on less processed plant foods versus usual care. And at six months, the intervention group had actually lost more than four BMI points. I mean, that is truly astounding. Um, that, in, in this study, that turned out to be about 12 kilograms. And they saw very little weight regain, which is what we almost always see after the first six months, people tend to regain weight. But in this study, there was very little weight regain over the next six months. So this really was a durable effect over a year. Um, and what's most fascinating, I think, is that um, what they, their approach was to not specifically recommend calorie restriction. So um, participants were not asked to count calories. And if you've ever had to count or you know, tried to count calories yourself, you know how tedious this can be. Um, participants were just simply asked to eat foods that were low in their calorie density. So basically fruits, vegetables, legumes like beans, lentils, chickpeas, and whole grains. And that 
achieve this effect. They were not even really asked to restrict portion sizes. So um, pretty impressive. Inflammation is really, uh, as we know, is really a, a, a key element in the pathogenesis of cardiovascular disease. So there too, plant-based diets play a big role. Um, systematic reviews and meta-analyses show that um, consistently plant-based diets are linked to, to, to decreased um, markers of inflammation. And then we have a couple of um, randomized controlled trials, potentially more, but I, I know of a couple of key randomized controlled trials that compare a fully plant-based diet to what is really a both in both cases a very healthy control diet. So in one case a portfolio, uh, in one case a, a, a diet with very low saturated fat, and the other case an American Heart Association diet. Um, in both cases, the uh, the fully plant based diet was more effective um, at lowering CRP than the healthy control diet. So again, um, yet another reason to consider um, a fully plant based diet. And turning to, um, to gut metabolites, gut bacterial metabolites, I mean, I think one of the things that we've um, learned in the last 20 years is really that it's not just about the nutrients we're consuming like cholesterol or saturated fat or heme iron. It's really about how those nutrients, um, how nutrients in our foods interact with our gut bacteria. So TMAO is probably the best known example. Uh, so TMAO, of course, is a molecule that is formed when we consume uh, foods uh, rich in phosphatidylcholine or L-carnitine, uh, such as eggs or red meats. Our gut flora will transform those nutrients into trimethylamine, which is then um, oxidized to trimethylamine and oxide. And TMAO is really thought to be an accelerator of atherosclerosis through some of the potential uh, mechanisms I've shown here on the left. And in terms of observational or prospective data, um, it's been linked to increases in cardiovascular uh, mortality, CHF mortality, and all-cause mortality. And again, you can lower your TMAO levels fairly quickly by simply limiting your intake of these uh, precursor foods. So I wanna take a few minutes now to focus on diabetes. And um, this is really a special passion of mine. I've seen so many, um, so many transformative stories in my practice where people use plant-based nutrition to treat um, their diabetes. So I wanna unpack this a little bit <clears throat> um, because there's a lot of confusion ar typically around nutrition for diabetes. So um, in plant-based diets, we know from observational data, um, this is a cross-sectional study looking at the odds of having type two diabetes in the Adventist cohort. Um, and what you can see is that um, this, is a, this is a large cohort of about 68,000 people. Um, vegans tend to have about half the risk of having type two diabetes as non-vegetarians. And what's most important is that, that that persists even when you adjust for body mass index shown in blue. And so that's, that's obviously very important given that um, overweight and obesity is really the, the biggest risk factor for developing type two diabetes. So um, again, this is hypothesis generating, but very um, compelling data. And then when we look prospectively, um, this is a huge systematic review and meta-analysis published in 2019, um, over 300,000 people. Um, what, what, what they concluded is that a healthful plant-based eating pattern is linked to a 30% lower risk of type two diabetes overall. And um, I love the fact that there's a positive dose response. Again, I keep emphasizing the more you go, um, the more benefit you get in really a linear, linear fashion um, in this study. And of course this was adjusted, um, everything was adjusted for body mass index and most of these studies also adjusted for other uh, potential uh, risk factors. So the question then becomes, wait a second, you're recommending a plant-based diet. Doesn't a plant-based diet with, with all of these foods, doesn't this contain a lot of carbohydrate? How is that going to prevent and even treat type two diabetes? Well, to answer that question, um, we need to go back to um, really the pathogenesis of insulin resistance. And so um, to discuss that, I wanna talk about what happens in the normal scenario where someone um, is insulin sensitive. So what we're looking at here is a skeletal muscle cell. Um, the bottom is the cytoplasm, the top is the, the bloodstream. And let's say that you um, eat a banana. Of course, your blood sugar will go up. Your, uh, then You'll then secrete insulin. It'll bind to its receptor on the skeletal muscle cell. And that will uh, trigger this insulin signaling cascade that brings GLUT4 channels to the cell membrane, which allow glucose to enter the cell. 
And this is a really, it's really important that this function normally, because if this is not functioning normally, after you eat a meal, your sugar is going to stay high. Your skeletal muscle is responsible for a significant proportion of your postprandial glucose disposal. So let's review the scenario where it's, uh, where now you're insulin resistant. So you, you eat that same banana, your blood sugar goes up, you secrete insulin, it binds to its receptor, so far so good. Um, but then something is blocking the um, insulin signaling cascade inside the cytoplasm. So not enough of the GLUT4 channels make it to the cell membrane and glucose just continues to build up outside the cell. And then you think to yourself, well, darn, I should have eaten that banana. Obviously this is the banana's fault, but is this actually the banana's fault? Is what's happening in the cytoplasm because of the banana or is the banana more of an innocent victim in this scenario? Um, well, what we know is it's actually um, the buildup of very specific lipid subspecies in the cytoplasm of skeletal muscle cells that impairs insulin signaling. And that's a phenomenon called lipotoxicity. And um, this lipid accumulation, not just in our skeletal muscle, but also in our liver is really the primary cause of insulin resistance. So you saw what happened in the skeletal muscle, there was decreased glucose uptake. Um, what happens in the liver is that you get reduced glycogen synthesis and increased gluconeogenesis, which is inappropriate because your blood sugar is already high. So this is sort of a triple whammy. So why are we accumulating lipids in our skeletal muscle and liver where you know, a safer place to store these lipids would be in our adipose tissue? Um, well, there's numerous reasons. Um, really, the, the first two are the most important. So excess adiposity and excess calories. There tends to be a spillover effect um, where some of the, the lipids tend to be stored um, in, in other organs. Um, there's also independently a role for excess dietary isolated fructose. And what I mean by that is fructose that's not in its whole form. So it's coming from, for example, high fructose corn syrup in, in a soda or uh, sucrose or table sugar added to foods. So any of these isolated um, fructose um, compounds can drive insulin resistance. In addition, um, dietary saturated fats, particularly in excess, um, seem to be very potent in triggering this lipotoxicity phenomenon. And then there's also a role for inflammation, oxidative stress, um, and dysfunction of mitochondria. So what does this all have to do with food? Um, <clears throat> well, now it is time for our second um, audience participation. I would love for you guys to guess uh, which of the following foods has been linked to the highest risk of type two diabetes. And you can throw your answers in the chat. <clears throat> your option is A, white breads and rolls, B, processed meats, C, sugar sweetened beverages, or D, white rice. Okay. I see, there are some excellent, uh, excellent test takers in the group. So <clears throat> the answer is processed meats. Um, so processed meats are uh, very, very closely aligned to the risk of type 2 diabetes. Um, they really are um, consistently um, show the highest risk for type 2 diabetes of any other food, um, where one serving a day, which is about uh, two pieces of bacon or 50 grams, um, is linked to a 37% increased risk of type 2 diabetes. And yet that's very confusing for our patients because if they eat two pieces of bacon, their sugar doesn't go up right after they eat that. It's more about driving the underlying pathogenesis um, and making you then not be able to tolerate eating that banana later on. So after processed meat, there's statistically a tie probably between red meats that are not processed and sugar sweetened beverages. Um, and no one is ever surprised to hear that um, sugar sweetened beverages are linked to type two diabetes. Um, but why would red and processed meats um, be linked to higher diabetes risk? Well, there's a number of uh, different potential mechanisms. I don't have time to go into all of them, but saturated fats definitely play a big role. Iron in its heme form um, may play a, a strong role, advanced glycation end products, nitrate preservatives, potentially even TMAO. And it's actually not just red and processed meats. Um, consistently, data show that um, higher consumption of animal protein in general is linked to higher risk of type 2 diabetes. And again, here we see a wonderful replacement analysis where substituting a plant source of protein instead of animal protein um, for just 5% of your calories um, was linked to a 23% lower risk of diabetes. And this has been consistent across multiple different studies. Again, that's a huge bang for your buck. 
for a pretty small change. Um, and even, <clears throat> even in patients who already have type 2 diabetes, replacing about a third of your calories with a plant source of protein instead of an animal protein actually has been shown in randomized trials to reduce hemoglobin A1C. And I can vouch for this in my practice. I see it all the time. Um, and really this is, um, I always say this, this photo, this, this study is just an excuse for me to show one of my favorite meals, which is tempeh tacos. And there's a great recipe um, here at this website if you're interested. Um, so this is a moment for a PSA, why we should all love legumes. Uh, very, very good for diabetes risk reduction and treatment. Um, but the food category that has been linked to the lowest risk of diabetes is actually a carbohydrate-rich food, which is whole grains. Whole grains um, have um, a type of, have fiber, of course, and like any fiber, uh, it improves the way our blood sugar responds to the food. It makes us feel more full. It makes the food less calorie dense. And all of that is great for people at risk of type 2 diabetes or who are living with diabetes. Um, but specifically, um, independent of those effects, the type of fiber that's found in whole grains um, really gets fermented by our gut bacteria to help us produce short chain fatty acids. And these molecules improve the way a mitochondria functions. They increase GLP-1 or and other incretin hormones. They can decrease inflammatory cytokines. And all of this translates into improved insulin sensitivity. What about that banana? Is that banana truly innocent? Well, I am always on the lookout for a study showing that fruit um, increases the risk of diabetes and I have yet to find one. And so if you find one, please send it to me. Um, this was the largest study that I'm aware of looking at the relationship between fruit consumption and type two diabetes. And in this study, consuming fruit was linked to a lower risk of type two diabetes, even with all, all of the adjustments for risk factors. Um, and in those who already have diabetes, consuming fruit just three times a week was associated with huge decreases in the risk of microvascular complications, macrovascular complications, and even all-cause mortality. So it's it's diabetes. So fruit is a wonderful food to encourage people to eat more of, um, even if they have pre-diabetes or type two diabetes. Um, I always say that fruit is literally the low-hanging fruit when it comes to nutrition counseling because most people really like to eat fruit, and it's extraordinarily good for you. And this brings me to the point that the term carbs is really um, a really a loaded term. It's confusing for patients because I think when most of us think of the word carbs, we're thinking of everything on the left. These are low quality carbohydrates, um, but everything on the right also contains carbohydrates. And these are very healthful foods they are high quality carbohydrates. But when we use the term carbs, we're literally lumping fruit loops with fruit. Um, so I prefer when I counsel patients to just say the names of the foods that I want my patients to eat more of or less of. It's just less confusing that way. And we know that high quality carbohydrates um, are linked to or show improvements in body weight, glycemic control, lipids and blood pressure in randomized trials. And in observational studies, we see reductions in um, heart outcomes like diabetes incidence, obesity, cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular mortality. So it's, it's, there's absolutely no need to limit these high quality carbohydrates in our diet. We really benefit from them. And just to wrap up the diabetes section, um, there are randomized control trials looking at plant-based diets specifically for treating type two diabetes. This was one published in 2009, comparing a low fat plant-based diet with a sort of American Diabetes Association um, 2003 standard diet. And what they found was better glycemic control with the plant-based diet, as well as better lipid reduction and more weight loss. So lots to love about uh, the plant-based approach. And this is really why all of this evidence is really why mainstream organizations like the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists uh, recommend specifically that patients with type 2 diabetes follow a primarily plant-based meal plan. So I, I would love to share um, a story from my own practice uh, around diabetes. This is a patient of mine, uh, Mrs. M, who's originally from uh, Mexico. She's in her 50s. And when I met her in August of 2016, I diagnosed her with type 2 diabetes with an A1C of 15.2. Um, she happened to have uh, no symptoms at the time, believe it or not. And she was very motivated to make intensive lifestyle changes. So we talked about how that would look. I encouraged a plant-based diet, um, more exercise. Um, I did start metformin. And lo and behold, 
Six months later, she has a reduction in her A1C to 5.8. Now, of course, um, some of that, of course, is from the metformin, but she had really made huge lifestyle changes. So um, she asked me if she could stop metformin. I, um, with some trepidation, I did, um, but I followed her closely. And over the course of the next 16 months, um, she did great. And she ended up with 16 months later with an A1C of 5.6. And this actually uh, meets the definition of diabetes remission. And I have to say on a personal note, this was one of the most rewarding moments I've ever had in my professional career. And every now and then you come across a patient who's extremely motivated. And when you give them the guidance that they want, they can do really well and have a health transformation like this. But even in my patients who have less dramatic stories, it's very, very rewarding to see people make changes and see, start to see benefits. So um, on that note, I wanna talk about if you're actually inspired to try doing this in your practice, what would that look like? What are some practical approaches? So um, first of all, as, as you heard from um, Dr. Hull's introduction, my clinical practice is at Bellevue Hospital, which is a safety net uh, facility. It's part of the New York City Health and Hospitals public hospital system. So the majority of my patients live at the federal poverty line um, or below, and it's an extremely culturally um, ethnic and ethnically diverse patient population. So everything I'm gonna share is in the context of that experience. So um, my first tip is um, to use the crowding out approach. And so what that looks like is really emphasizing to patients um, what I call the yes list. So what are the foods that I want you to eat more of? Instead of just talking about the foods to limit or avoid, people really like a positive message. This is one of the tools that we developed. Um, um, some people call it the yes list. Um, it's called superfoods. Um, but it's literally just a list of healthy plant foods across different categories. And the way we use it, um, it's in English and Spanish. So the way most of us use it is to have our patients let us know which foods on this list they already happen to like and are familiar with and know how to prepare. And then using, using that information that the patient shares with you, you can start brainstorming together. Well, how can you include, you know, how I see that you like lentils. So how can you start including more lentils in your diet? Can you make a lentil soup and have that twice a week? Would that be something you could try? Um, and so this has been extraordinarily effective. If you're slow on time, you can actually, or rushed on time, you can actually give the patient this handout and have them come back the next visit with, you know, ideas marked off and discuss it at the next visit. Number two is making simple swaps. And I've talked a lot about this, um, but really what this looks like is helping patients get creative around what they can swap out. So um, instead of making you know, beef tacos, could you try making bean tacos? They're delicious. Lentil tacos, bean tacos, they taste great. Um, or even if you're not willing to go all the way, maybe you can mix um, some beans into your beef tacos and reduce the amount of um, beef. Um, could you swap chicken soup for lentil soup? Um, could you replace your a commercial breakfast cereal, which is usually processed and has added sugar with a bowl of old fashioned oatmeal. This is one of the healthiest breakfasts we can consume. Um, it's inexpensive, it's accessible to almost everyone, and it's culturally relevant to many, many different populations. Number three is helping your patients set very specific and uh, realistic um, or achievable goals. So the way I do this is um, I'll have my patient, I'll do a 24 hour recall or have them bring um, a three day food diary to my, to my next appointment. Um, and then based on what I'm seeing, it's just a general sense of what they're eating. I will uh, come up with a menu of different options of things they could work on. These are just some examples here on the left. I'll let them pick one. It's key that they be the one to pick. And just, just one, let them pick one category and then we turn it into a SMART goal. So very specific and measurable and realistic. Um, these are, you know, for example, they don't leave my office saying I'm gonna eat more vegetables because that's very vague. It turns into, I'm gonna add a serving of broccoli or salad to my dinner plate three times this week. Keep in mind, again, any movement along the spectrum from the way Americans typically eat to a uh, plant-based diet that's healthful any movement is beneficial and should be celebrated. So number four, uh, for the patients who are really ready to try more intense changes, you can have them, um, you can brainstorm what's a way that you could change your lunch into a plant-based meal, um, your breakfast or your dinner, and try doing that once, once a day, have a plant-based meal. Or for really motivated patients, um, do a little meal planning and then come up with a three-week jumpstart. So you're gonna go plant-based for three weeks. And what's great about that is people feel 
usually they feel amazing after those three weeks and you can see measurable drops in blood pressure, uh, lipids and blood sugar after those three weeks. Some tools for these patients are um, at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, there's a Food as Medicine Jumpstart, which is a free download. Um, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, PCRM.org has a free 21 day kickstart that's both in English and Spanish. Um, and then a local uh, nonprofit here in New York City, um, which is open to anybody, has wonderful webinars on plant-based nutrition in both English and Spanish, um, totally free, um, as well as they, they do run jumpstarts. I would caution you that um, when your patient is making any dietary change, um, you need to monitor them closely, especially if they're on insulin or sulfonylureas, as they can get hypoglycemic. Um, they can get hypotensive. And of course, if they're on warfarin you, um, and eating more leafy greens um, and vitamin K, other vitamin K rich foods, you'll need to adjust their warfarin um, and see them back quickly. So I don't have time to go into um, all of the nitty gritty about nutrients on a plant-based diet, but I'm happy to take questions um, and I'm gonna share some resources for this. Um, but the most important thing to remember is anyone following a mostly or fully plant-based diet should really supplement with B12. And I've put the recommendations here um, for the specific dosing. Um, other keys to success are really to work within your patient's cultural traditions. So you want to ask about and emphasize the plant foods that are culturally relevant to the patient already. So the way that looks for me, um, for example, I take care of a lot of patients from West Africa, and I might say to them, you know, on the interpreter phone, we have Google images open, and I'll just type in um, legumes, and a bunch of images of legumes will come up, and I will just say, which of these foods, if any, are you already familiar with, and do you happen to like, and how can you um, build those more into your meals? Um, I would put a plug for Old Ways, which is a nonprofit looking at a variety of traditional diets from around the world. It has great recipes that are um, uh, plant predominant. Um, it's a great resource. Of course, you want to ask about food insecurity and access to healthy foods. Um, you want to find out how comfortable your patient is with cooking. So for some patients who do not know how to cook or don't have kitchen, um, reasonable kitchen access, your advice is gonna look different. You're gonna to have to be more creative um, and you wanna involve their family. I will always ask a patient, if you wanna bring your significant other to an appointment, we can work together so that everybody's on board. Um, again, celebrate any nugget of positivity so your patient stays um, excited and inspired to keep trying to do more. Um, so what about patients who um, have um, significant financial limitations? Well, I think on the one hand, it's a little bit of a myth that a plant-based diet has to be um, expensive because many of the plant foods um, in their less processed forms are actually very inexpensive. Um, this is actually a data supported statement they're, that they're less expensive typically than meat, poultry, eggs, or seafood. So if you're buying highly convenience um, plant-based foods, pre-prepared foods, yes, that's going to be more expensive. But if you focus on dried or canned legumes, um, frozen vegetables, especially in the winter time when vegetables are more expensive, root vegetables like sweet potatoes, um, whole grains, especially if you can buy them in bulk like oats or um, brown rice or barley, um, those are all great options. And of course, there's a cost savings on what you're not buying. So you're going to be swapping these in and swapping out other foods. So in my last uh, two minutes, um, I'd love to tell you about the program that I run at Bellevue. This is a plant-based lifestyle medicine program that launched in uh, 2019. And our mission is really to reduce cardiovascular risk um, and, and, and metabolic risk. And I personally am on a mission to make this type of service um, uh, to make this type of service available to people who are, are at our most vulnerable populations who face the highest burden of chronic disease. So we have a whole team um, of physicians, dietitians, a health coach, a coordinator, and a volunteer. And we, we work with all aspects of lifestyle change. So it's not just the healthy diet, it's also other, other pillars of healthy lifestyle. And we do this through individual visits and group visits. Um, this is a starter guide that we developed that we're, that we're very proud of. Um, and our outcomes are, um, first of all, we've seen huge interest in this type of a program. So I think patients really want to learn how to change their lifestyle. They want the support and guidance. So we have a huge waiting list um, that we're working through. Um, our patients report significant improvements in their health behaviors, especially their dietary um, habits. 
And we have seen statistically significant and clinically significant improvements um, in body weight. Most of our patients have lost weight when they come in overweight. Um, the, uh, blood sugar control, as well as diastol diastolic blood pressure. Our patients report that they feel great um, and they're very, very satisfied with the program. So it's extremely rewarding. So I will, I'm happy to pass along these slides so everyone has a copy of these resources um, that, I'd, that I'd love to share with anybody. And I will stop there and take time for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. McMechan. That was an incredible talk as I, I knew it would be. And um, I think you've really hammered home why we need to focus much more than we, than we have um, historically on, on educating uh, patients and helping them to implement, implement healthier diets. Um, because as, as everyone can see, the, the data are really, really robust. And, um, and with, the, with the right tools and the right approaches, it doesn't have to be financially prohibitive. And indeed, as you said, um, it actually is, is cheaper to buy the unprocessed foods, even though you know, really, really fancy uh, vegan meat substitutes in, in you know, Michelin restaurants in New York, for example, um, might be very expensive. That's, that's not, uh, plant-based diets aren't just for you know, well, wealthy, uh, privileged people. Um, and on the contrary, I, I think that, that, people, that patients with less privilege um, due to structural uh, inequities actually potentially stand to benefit the most from this kind of counseling. And, and we really, I, I, we, we have an ethical obligation to, to ensure that our, our patients um, get better access to, to education and resources. And I, I will say that at, at Yale, we certainly don't have the kind of program that, that you've established um, at NYU, but we are working um, with our uh, with our diet and nutrition services and with our cardiac rehab services um, to create plant based menu options to create um, more educational opportunities with cardiac rehab um, and you know but but we need we need to do more and, and we need to do better um, so that's with that um, I will it looks like Dr Mani has a question <clears throat> yes I mean I enjoyed very much your talk and uh, this was a very important topic that. We all when do prevention deal with, but one question I have, and is that if one formula for everybody that you you know it sometimes be present that way, and I have in my experience seen patients who respond, some patients respond much better to actually lowering you know meat in the diet and the cholesterol improves. Some people actually respond much better to cutting the carbs, and there are variation there, and I wonder if you have considered that because. There is not always a similar response in everybody. And the second question I have is that you did not mention much about the role of fish, although we always talk about fish when we talk about omega-3 fat and, you know, et cetera. But what is your take on that? Great. So two excellent questions. So for the first question, I agree that people certainly have different responses and, and definitely different dietary preferences. And um, I always make the argument that you can apply a plant predominant approach to any type of macronutrient profile that you want. So um, for a patient who um, does better with a lower, uh, lower refined carbohydrates in their diet, um, first of all, that's part of a healthy plant-based diet, but you can do a low carb plant predominant approach by focusing more on healthy plant proteins and plant fats. Um, and, it, and again, it doesn't have to be 100%. Um, so, so that is an option. Um, I, I think as regarding the fish, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I think it is, you know, if, if, if we look at of all the different animal foods um, and the evidence surrounding their benefit, I would say you could probably make the strongest case for including fish in the diet. Um, we know that there's a range of, you know, many, many studies showing benefits of consuming um, omega-3 rich fish. Um, but I would also make the argument that first of all, we don't need fish every single day. The amount that we would need to get the omega-3 benefits would be a couple of servings a week. And there are also um, significant concerns around um, planetary health and, and sustainability around consuming, recommending everybody consume even that much fish. Um, that's a whole nother topic. Um, if you choose to exclude fish from your diet, you can get the benefits of the omega-3s from consuming plant-based sources such as walnuts, ground flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds, um, flax seeds being the most economical. And um, what I recommend for my patients who have metabolic disease is I do recommend an algae-based omega-3 formulation, um, which contains EPA and DHA. Um, and there you're sort of skipping the middle fish, you know, because fish get their omega-3s from algae. Um, so that's, that's another option. Great questions, thank you. 
Great. Thank you. I, I actually have the uh, the algae oil, the Nordic Naturals algae, algae oil <laughs> DHA uh, EPA supplement. Um, so I, I will second that. Um, I'm going, going to go to the chat. I'm trying to do things in sort of the order that they uh, came in. Um, illuminating talk, learned a lot and great presentation, agree. Uh, can you speak to the interaction effects of this type of diet with intermittent fasting or caloric restriction in cardiovascular disease? Yeah, I've given, I've given this a lot of thought because intermittent fasting um, is, uh, you know, what, what we know overall about intermittent fasting is that is, it is equal to calorie restriction when it comes to weight loss. It's just a matter of preference. Um, there may be some additional benefits in terms of, you know, there's, there's theories around longevity. Those are largely animal-based um, animal studies. Um, um, but I, I think that my take is that nobody has ever actually looked at comparing an, a, a intermittent fasting with a standard diet to a healthful plant-based diet. And you actually do get typically a lower calorie diet, as I've mentioned before, when you're consuming a plant-based diet that's in a healthy version. Um, so, you know, for patients who um, really struggle with weight loss, um, who are already consuming a healthful plant-based diet, of course, you know, I run a weight management clinic. Um, there is a role for weight loss medications, but there may be in addition a role for looking at the timing of meals, um, trying to stack meals earlier in the day. Um, there may, you know, and, and, and for people even to count calories if they're willing to do that. Um, but for the average person, they do very well with just adopting a healthful plant-based diet, depending on what type of diet they're starting from, they almost always lose weight up front. Thank you. Um, I, I'm not sure who, who De Silva three, but there's a hand raised. Is that person able to? Thank you very much for this talk. It was very interesting indeed. I'm just curious about the outcomes of a pescatarian diet high in farm raised salmon versus wild type. Is there any difference or has it, uh, has it even been compared? No. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, um, you know, I don't, I don't know that they, that they've looked. There's certainly not any hard outcome studies that I'm aware of comparing farmed raised to wild raised salmon. Um, there may be some differences in fatty acid, you know, profile. There are differences in fatty acid profiles. There's also concerns around um, with farm raised salmon. You do get concerns around use of additional. Um, um, antimicrobial agents that are used um, to prevent infections in these animals. It's just like factory farmed, um, you know, beef or factory farmed um, pig, or you know, it, it's there's there's um, concerns around the, the 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 additions that are used there. So, if anything, if if it's affordable, wild raised is probably better, um, just for that reason alone. Great. Um, does the next question is from the chat. Uh, does your counseling include specific exercise or physical activity recommendations? Always, always. So, um, you know, I think uh, there's that term exercise is medicine. I think that's actually, I think that's actually a website. Um, and um, absolutely, I, I recommend patients adopt both, um, not just cardio, you know, cardio or aerobic exercise, but also resistance training, which we know um, plays a huge role in metabolic benefits. Um, part of our program is actually to teach patients how to do resistance training with very inexpensive resistance bands, because most people know how to do cardio. <laughs> you can just take a walk, um, brisk walk, but they don't know how to do resistance training. So that's a key part of our program. Awesome. Um, another question slash comment from the chat. That was an excellent talk. We have a population here in New Haven not dissimilar to the Bellevue population. How would you go about implementing this on a system-wide scale as you have? We are working on this through a preventive cardiovascular health program. I sort of made some mention of similar efforts, but again, how, how do we scale this up and, and make it do, do it the way you've done it? Yeah, well, we, we, we started out with only doing individual visits with our team, um, and we quickly realized with this big waiting list to, to really uh, meet the demand and the need, we were going to need to do group sessions. Um, and so th with the groups, you can actually reach a lot of people. Um, a lot more quickly and more efficiently. And actually there's the synergistic effect of the groups where patients learn from each other, they get su social support from each other. Um, and so I would definitely recommend that. Those can actually be billed as um, uh, 
medically, um, you know, as a shared medical appointments. So those there's there's a financial, you know, sustainability aspect to that as well. Um, so I think groups are really at the core of making of making this um, scalable. Um, and I would say at the same time, um, educating um, the whole the whole environment, the whole you know, changing the culture of the institution um, is part of it too to get buy in. As I know you guys are doing, and and we're we're doing at Bellevue. Well, I, I think that's a, a perfect note upon which to end because we are at our time. Um, I, I think I think the idea of institutional cultural change is is really key, um, and not just at individual institutions, although that's necessary, but also the institution of medicine, you know, and the profession of medicine in, in general. Um, and you've really given us a, a lot a lot to think about and. Um, Thank you so, so much for taking the time to, to speak with us today. Um, we really appreciate it. And um, I, I think I can speak for all of us when I say we've learned a lot. Thank you so much. It's really been a huge pleasure.